there, then, all right, so today we are finishing up, finally finishing up the psychedelic spotlight, and don't worry, we will return to many of these concepts in the near future. So if you're like, oh, I feel like I don't know enough about psychedelics, or we didn't go in depth enough, we will return to them. I just wanted to give you a brief overview. And then today we're going to segue into possibly the most, in terms of like festival environments, the most applicable and important important and most poorly understood drug in popular recreational culture right now is molly. So that's a really important one to know about. I'm stoked that we get to do it today. It's amazing. So just to kind of like backtrack a little bit on, hey you guys. Sorry, would you mind going into the kitchen or, or some other alternative to very reasonably loud voices. I'm sorry, I can't get that sentence out. You guys can continue doing what you're doing. I'm not trying to be a bitch. Uh, these walls are so thin. Okay, so um, DMT comes in two primary forms. The first is crystalline, and then that can also become powder form. In fact, DMT can often, and I know this is backtracking a little bit from last time, um, DMT can often come in the form of what looks almost like curry powder, like a yellowish powder that smells, smel smells, smells a little bit like, like um, shoe polish. Um, or it can come in the form of a DMT containing plant that's mixed into ayahuasca. And we'll come back to more about ayahuasca in the, the future, but just know that for now, ayahuasca is a brew that was primarily produced in South America that consists of a DMT containing plant and also an MAOI containing plant. So an, an example of um, the MAOI containing plant might be Syrian rue or passion flower, and those are naturally occurring. When we're smoking DMT though, right, and you have to smoke it in powder or crystal form, and there are a couple of different ways to smoke it. Smoking DMT is not a particularly pleasant experience to the point where a lot of people can't actually blast off, which means that you break through this kind of psychedelic barrier that pushes you into the realm of being totally disconnected from your current environment, which is what a lot of people are looking for with DMT. Um, usually it, it's a very harsh and plastic tasting uh, smoke. It's really difficult to hold in your lungs and you need to do it for as long as possible to feel the effects and it, it comes on so quickly that by the time you've come up on the effects you don't even remember that you're holding your breath and you can exhale and a lot of people just kind of like sink back or sometimes like curl up on their side. Um, DMT highs only last between like five and max 15 minutes. In some rare cases, they might last a little bit longer than 15 minutes, but even that is like very long in comparison. Sometimes it only lasts like three minutes, three to five minutes. If you eat it, on the other hand, it's gonna be a little bit longer of a come up, well, quite a bit longer of a come up and experience. If you eat it in the form of ayahuasca, you can't just eat straight DMT. It's not like other hallucinogens where you can just like internalize them, <laughs> internalize them, digest them. Um, so you do need to combine it with an MAOI for it to work, and we'll come back to why in a little bit. Um, ayahuasca is like a five to ten hour trip, and it takes about the same amount of time as LSD to come up on, maybe a little bit shorter, generally speaking, but smoking it, you come up within like seconds of fully inhaling and keeping it in your lungs. Now, DMT has been being used in ritualistic settings, particularly in South America, for a really, really long time, right? Especially because you can just kind of like grind up plant matter, in some cases, or extracts. I actually don't know exactly what the process is. I should know this. But um, effectively, you can use a tool to snort it into someone else's nose. You put a little bit of the material in the base of a pipe and like a blow dart into their brain. So this has been done for ages. And also ayahuasca ceremonies, which are a very complex cultural kind of situation that is a huge hotbed of appropriation right now that we'll return to in, in great detail later. Um, ayahuasca has been around forever, really, and it's often used in medicinal contexts primarily. And then there's this guy, Richard Mansky. You don't need to know who he is. The point is that he's just another white guy that managed to extract the same chemical that has been being used in plants for generations, and he was um, gaining scientific popularity for this extraction, even though the same thing exists in a plant that was deemed dirty. So we'll see that over and over again. On a chemical level, DMT functions pretty straightforwardly as a serotonin agonist with a couple little sprinklings in there. Um, it has some action on dopamine as well. So remembering what we know about neurotransmitters, remember serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's primarily responsible for um, perception and pleasure and mood, whereas 
dopamine is, is primarily concerned with reward and motor control. And mood can be influenced by those things. But the big thing with serotonin is perception, right? Um, so think about how that would influence the effect or how the effects of a drug would influence you if they're influencing a neurotransmitter that's responsible for guiding perception of things. You can extract DMT fairly easily, actually. It's like a household kind of thing. You need a limited number of supplies and you can just like pull DMT out of DMT containing plants um, and make your own crystal out of it. It's actually a pretty common DIY thing. Or you can brew it in the form of like actual plant matter. Now you can buy a lot of this plant matter on the internet, but there are a lot of social cultural concerns that arise from taking this traditionally prepared brew and bring it into your living room, basically. So hold off on doing any major moves of buying ayahuasca materials on the internet until we've talked about why this probably isn't a good thing to be doing right now. And when it comes to adulterating DMT, it's actually an interesting one because DMT is somewhat revered in, in a lot of psychedelic communities. It's considered to be an experience to be gifted by a lot of people that do it. So surprisingly enough, I would say that the rate of adulteration of DMT is quite low compared to other drugs. This is not a free pass to just be like, well, this person handed me this powder and it smells like the bottom of my feet, so I might as well smoke it. It's not what I'm saying. I am saying though that there is an interesting kind of culture around DMT as like a smokable crystalline substance, where oftentimes at the right kind of parties, someone will just come up to you and be like, can I give you a DMT experience? They'll just do that, that happens sometimes. And that's unlike a lot of other drugs. Because it's so difficult to hold it in your lungs and because it's such a short time commitment, a lot of people feel like it's a, an easily guided experience compared to other drugs because if someone's having a really intense DMT trip, they're probably not going to be able to communicate with you. So it's a lot easier than having to talk someone down off of a 24 hour long like binge of <laughs> LSD and mushrooms combined and like, it's just easier that way. Also, I put this gif in here at the beginning of this course and I have absolutely no idea why. So, so just to give a brief overview of psychedelics and kind of why, because we've looked at the, the neurochemical part of this, right? We've looked at the neurotransmitters that they act on and the general consensus is that psychedelics act on serotonin and sometimes they act on dopamine a little bit and sometimes on glutamate a little bit so we can put that together and think okay psychedelics act on a neurotransmitter responsible for pleasure and and perception and also they influence your sleep as well um, they might also have a little bit of impact on a neurotransmitter that influences your reward and motor control okay and they might also have a little bit of impact on a neurotransmitter glutamate that's responsible for facilitating communication between brain and body and within the brain. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So we can put that together to get a little bit of an idea that generally speaking, this is the profile that psychedelics have. But the, the way that each individual one exerts its effects is still unique. They all are very different drugs, even if they have generally similar sensations that come with them. So a lot of people call LSD more metallic. That's a very common word for it. It's considered to be a little bit more like um, sparkly and rainbowy and like electric in a lot of ways. Um, acid is way more commonly used as a party drug than other psychedelics because generally speaking the mantra is acid puts you in the driver's seat, shrooms take you for a ride. Is this universal? No. Acid can absolutely take you for a ride <laughs> even when you're not expecting it and you think that you know your shit. So fractals are a really huge part of LSD and particular fractals that like appear in very pattern oriented ways. With psilocybin on the other hand, um, mushrooms have this really interesting property where they're, obviously they're a naturally occurring psychedelic that grow all over the world. But psilocybin is one of the few drugs where people will come together on message boards or in person or whatever and talk about their experiences and be like, oh, actually, I, I saw that same thing. Oh, like I met that sentient mushroom being too. And that's really like strange, right? Like, I'm not gonna read too deep into that. You know, we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole, but it is one of the few psychedelics where people genuinely report like, oh yeah, like I feel a presence with psilocybin. It feels like you are entering someone else's home. And that's part of why psilocybin does have a tendency to be more spiritual for people 
um, on a subjective rating scale, people do think that psychic psilocybin is more spiritual and also earthier and more difficult to control. Like psilocybin, if you're tripping on mushrooms, you have to be prepared to go where the mushrooms want to take you, basically. And that's something that some people don't learn until they're fighting whatever they're experiencing in their trip. With mescaline, it's also considered to be an earthier drug, whatever that means to you, um, and more empathogenic, so more open-hearted with other people, a little bit more sociable in that regard, interestingly, and also used primarily in spiritual contexts as opposed to party contexts. Um, however, there are many reports of people meeting or interacting gods on mescaline. And then there's DMT. Um, which is like the short and dirty psychedelic, but not actually dirty. DMT is just really fucking intense, y'all. And aliens are a really common occurrence that people report interacting with on DMT. So in particular, if any of you are into Terrence McKenna and that weird-ass voice that he has as a human being and his incredibly unusual thoughts about the world ending, You've probably heard Terrence McKenna go, the gnomes have learned the new way to save Ray and whatever else he says about like the DMT elves and what you meet on DMT. Looking at the subjective harms of these drugs, I want to, I don't even need to point anything out here, I don't think, honestly. Um, <laughs> the phrase I've heard is that LSD is like being in the driver's seat of an out-of-control car and psilocybin is like being in the trunk of an out-of-control car <laughs> and sometimes the driver is a clown. That's a really strong analogy. <laughs> Um, I would say it's a little bit like more chill than that, honestly. At the end of the day, I do think that there is a really important power to remembering that you inherently regain some control over a drug experience by accepting that you're not in control. And that's a really important part. We're going to cover a lot of this when we go to trip sitting and the psychedelic experience and how it can be different from person to person. There are some times where you just have to fucking ride the wave. There are times when psychedelics are taking you into a part of your mind that you might not be ready to go into. And there are other times where you have incredibly sparkly, lighthearted trips where everything's hilarious and nothing goes wrong and you feel great. And you have to be ready for both period. And it's just, I think, a very beautiful dichotomy of you can't have the really sparkly experiences without cleaning the skeletons out of your closet first. And sometimes psychedelics will just like force you to do that. You have to be ready. <laughs> you got to pay the, the troll toll. So looking at the relative harms of these substances, consistently, there are a lot of these studies or there are a lot of variations of this similar study that are out now, but consistently, classical psychedelics are rated at the bottom of the relative harm scale. And the reason for this is that psychedelics do not cause damage to your body in the way that other drugs do. And they're also not dependence forming or addiction slash habit forming in the vast majority of cases. The number of adverse effects that have like real physiological or psychological consequences from psychedelics for people are quite low, honestly, compared to other substances. However, it's a lot more diff or it's a lot easier to have like a difficult drug experience on psychedelics than it is on other drugs. It's, a, it's an opportunity cost, you know? Like, I would say that one of the easiest recreational drugs to be on at like casual doses is ketamine. I don't think that like mushrooms are the easiest drug to be on at recreational doses, you know? Like, it, they just have different things. But ketamine, if you do it too frequently, you damage your bladder and your kidneys. So like, you gotta, you know, see what you need. Um, also, in terms of the toxicity profile, mescaline and other naturally occurring or some naturally occurring psychedelics have a slightly higher risk um, on a physiological level if you take too much, simply because naturally occurring psychedelics often occur concurrently with naturally occurring toxins in the plants that they're in. Again, this is not that, like, it's not like a really on the table as a concern unless you're eating a very large quantity of a mescaline containing plant. And um, you should always check interactions with blood pressure medications in particular with naturally occurring psychedelics because naturally occurring psychedelics can often come hand in hand with like hypertensive things. We failed to find any associations between lifetime use of psychedelics and past year serious psychological distress, receiving or needing mental health treatment, depression, anxiety, or suicidal thoughts or behavior in the past year. Rather, lifetime use of psychedelics was associated with decreased inpatient psychiatric treatment. 
In supervised lab studies, psychedelic drugs like psilocybin from magic mushrooms and LSD seem to produce a psychological or mystical experience so powerful that they could help treat conditions like end of life anxiety, depression, addiction, and obsessive compulsive disorder. We'll come back to all these studies at a later time. If anyone has questions about the risks and potential downfalls of taking psychedelics with a pre-existing health condition slash mental health condition, then let me know because again, I know that's one of the most highly asked questions about psychedelics is can I take them given my family history or my personal mental health? Let's look at some harm reduction for psychedelics. Please trust me, if you are psychedelic naive, don't do them in a party setting first. You can always work up to that. But doing psychedelics in a party setting is a very different animal than doing them at home or with people that you trust. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to prepare yourself mentally and physically and environmentally for being on a drug that can make you quite vulnerable. It is easy to get confused on psychedelics. It's very easy to have difficulty completing basic tasks on psychedelics. You do not want to be stuck at a venue trying to find your ride home when you can't figure out what in your purse is a pack of cigarettes versus your phone, <laughs> because sometimes the sensory wires simply get crossed. Um, it's always very possible to have really positive psychedelic experiences in a party setting. However, you really, really need to trust me when I say start low, go slow, because oftentimes it's fine until it's not. Um, case in point, I was working a festival a couple of years ago and someone was like, oh yeah, I love doing acid at like EDC. Like I did acid at EDC Orlando and it was amazing. I had such a good time. And I was like, wow, that sounds like it would be so overwhelming. You're around like, what is it, 200,000 people at a time and it's loud everywhere and you're cold and you can't back to get back to your stuff and you can't drive yourself and everything's expensive and there's nowhere for you to sit to escape the noise. And they were like, yeah, you know, but like I had a great time. And I was like, well, be careful. And I see this person the next day and they were like, I just spent all of last night in the Oasis, which is like the mental health, like safe zone at EDC. So it's, it, it's like amazing until sometimes it's just not. And being at a festival environment or a party environment can make you feel like I'm supposed to feel social. I'm supposed to be outgoing right now, but it's so easy to get overwhelmed and it's okay. There's no shame in that. You should really know yourself with psychedelics before you do them at a party. You're set is your mindset during an experience, how you are thinking about and, concept and perceptualizing, conceptualizing an experience. Um, your set is possibly the most important part of this because if you go into a psychedelic experience, recognizing and understanding the inherent um, potential discomfort that you might feel, then you give yourself permission to feel other things in the meantime. You need to go into a trip with psychedelics recognizing how fluid it can be and how you might end up going down rabbit holes that you're not in the mood to go down and you have to roll with the punches every time. You need to be prepared for these things to be the case. <laughs> not gonna read that one out loud. Um, your setting is your surroundings during experience, but this can also be the people that you're with. Um, two fingers in the air if you've ever tripped with someone that you didn't really like that much and it's bit you in the ass. <laughs> like, it's really easy for that to happen, you know? You really want to be around people that you trust very deeply when you're on psychedelics. Intention setting, again, we'll get to this when we do trip sitting. I can't get hung up on this now, I'm too excited. Intention setting is a really important part of preparing for a psychedelic experience. It's verbally stating or writing down on paper to yourself and maybe also to the people around you, how you're feeling, what you would like to maybe achieve or get out of this experience, what you expect might happen during this experience, but also giving yourself verbal room to not have the experience go how you expect. And you would be shocked at how much this alleviates. So for instance, if you know for yourself that sometimes you get a little bit overwhelmed on a social level, because being in a social environment while tripping can be very difficult. It can be like stressful, you can be unsure of what you need to say. And on a neurological level, psychedelics make you less capable of reading other people's facial expressions and body language. So you might be around people and have a really hard time understanding how they're feeling. 
or you might start mistrusting them for other reasons. But if before you trip, you talk to the people that you're about to trip with and you're like, okay, I know that sometimes I get really quiet when I'm tripping and need to go and be by myself for a while. It has nothing to do with you. That's just sometimes how I am. I'm still having a great time. I have no hard feelings against any of you. Just want to give a heads up. And that way, when it happens during the experience, you're not struggling to find the words to be like, no hard feelings, but I need to go be my, myself right now. And it gives people informed consent as well. Informed consent with psychedelics is huge. <laughs> always start small with psychedelics. You can always go bigger, like really... <laughs> Unless you're very experienced with psychedelics and you are fully ready to be consumed by the void, please don't just double an existing dose and hope for the best if you're not really prepared for that, because it can be extremely overwhelming. Respect psychedelics, honestly. If you respect psychedelics, they'll respect you more back. And sometimes they'll still kick your ass. Doesn't mean that they don't respect you, though. Sometimes it is what you need. You get the trip you need not necessarily the one that you want. And I absolutely 100% guarantee that there is always a lesson to be learned from every psychedelic experience, even if the only lesson is sometimes things don't go as planned and how to deal with that and learn how to deal with that. So if you ever need help integrating an experience, let me know. I'm really good at spinning it because <laughs> sometimes it feels like there's no lesson. You're like, this is just garbage. <laughs> Make sure that you're getting educated on mental health concerns before you do these things. Make sure that you know how to recognize signs of acute psychosis in other people, because that's a really important way of protecting your friends. Let's talk briefly about a bad trip. And I want to make it clear that through the rest of this course, I refer to bad trips as difficult experiences or challenging experiences. And something that I hope I can drill home to you during this course is the power of referential language. People are so lax with their language, especially around drugs, and reducing people's personalities to the drugs that they use, and stigmatizing their behaviors based on the drugs that they use. But also, referring to difficult experiences on psychedelics as bad trips basically infers that like these trips were negative and have no potential positive value. The way that you look at them is really vastly important and also a skill that will translate to your sober life if you allow it to. A traditionally defined so-called bad trip or challenging experience often consists of looping, which means that you just get stuck on one thought. You are just in that thought loop. And sometimes it can be as simple as, I'm in Florida. And then 30 seconds later, someone's like, here are XYZ reasons why you're not in Florida. And you'll be like, okay, for sure. And then you look at a palm tree on the wall and you're like, I'm in Florida. And this just continues over and over and over again. And it can happen with many different things. It can happen looping on an idea or a person or like a thought of where you are or just like realizing you don't want to be tripping anymore. Then there's body horror. And body horror often comes in the form of a really like a common one is, am I bleeding? Or is my brain coming out of my nose? If you have like a runny nose. Those are really common ones. The am I bleeding one is really easy for people to mistake because your skin often becomes very textured, especially under certain lighting on psychedelics. So it's easy for some people that are tripping too hard subjectively to look at their own skin and be uncertain of whether or not they're okay and to be confused about their internal body processes. And in trip sitting, we'll talk about some really easy ways that you can reassure someone that has body horror. Psychosis is a disconnect from reality. You are not processing reality as it is happening. And this can often lead to delusions or sometimes just a total unreachability. Most of the time, I would say psychosis is acute. That means that it happens during the period of tripping. Sometimes it can extend beyond that. Again, when we get to trip sitting, we'll talk about what that looks like and what to do in response to that. And then there's anxiety, which is honestly probably the most major one. And it leads to a lot of these other things. But feeling incapable of communicating is a huge source of anxiety. Psychedelics just make it hard to say how you feel. Make it hard to talk about what you're experiencing. Something as simple as asking someone like, hey, do you want to tell me about your trip? Like, how are you feeling? Can sometimes make someone like snap and start crying because they realize that they've been thinking I'm having a hard time and not known how to say it. I'm not going to get into trip sitting now. Too much. Okay, let's talk about MDMA. Woo. Okay. Um, so in this, we're going to go into MDMA and MDMA-like drugs or MDMA-type drugs, um, specifically MDA. And a little bit later, we'll get into other adulterants like synthetic cathinones, which are bath salts and see how those work. 
So um, what are some examples of traditional classical psychedelics? LSD? LSD? Magic mushrooms. Magic mushrooms. <laughs> Mescaline. Mescaline, and what else? Deemster. Deemster, very nice. Also, um, in response to the comment, wow, it seems like the probability of having a bad trip is not worth it, cost-benefit analysis. So we need to remember something really important here, which is you have to ask yourself why you're doing psychedelics in the first place. If you're doing psychedelics with the intention of only having a good time, then they're just not going to give you what they're capable of giving you. If you go into a psychedelic experience, mm -hmm basically being like, no, go ahead. If you go into a psychedelic experience, basically being like, I want to grow as a person is a really good one. Or I want to see like what I can gain from this and like how I can improve my own ability to respond to unexpected situations. It totally changes the experience. And positive or easy trips on psychedelics are really, really exceptional and have the potential to fully change your life. I would say that most people will need to go through a period of having difficult experiences on psychedelics before they can get to like consistently having easy trips. And the reason is that people have a lot of buried traumas. People have a lot of buried insecurities. And at the end of the day, like that's just something where you can either go to therapy for 10 years to work those things out, or sometimes you can have a trip on mushrooms that untangles a knot that you've been dealing with for a long time. You just have to really be willing to put in the work. And you have to be willing to accept that or just, I'm curious with, of what states of being are possible. Yeah, it's a really remarkable tool for better understanding how your mind works in response to everything. It gives you a glimpse. It allows you to be a little more analytical about it. And I'll go more into this, like so tempted to just keep going on this. Okay, so classical psychedelics include LSD, mushrooms, mescaline, and DMT. Some elements of a difficult trip might be looping, body horror, fear slash anxiety, or psychosis. And we'll go into greater detail of all of those later in the course. What neurotransmitter do classical psychedelics act on? Bonus points if you know the specific receptor. An MDA? Not quite, but I'm thrilled that you remembered an NMDA. That is a glutamate receptor. That's the specific one for dissociatives, but like virtual high five for remembering this, that's a specific receptor. Serotonin. I'm not sure which receptor though. Nice. It is serotonin. The specific receptor is called the 5-HT2A receptor. <laughs> that's a mouthful. What is the likelihood of becoming dependent on psychedelics? That means that you go through withdrawals or build tolerance to them. Close to zero. Close to zero. What is an indicator that a tab may contain a dangerous adulterant? Bitterness. Taste. Nice. If it's bitter, it's a spitter. And what are two things that start with an S that can impact a trip? Set and setting. Excellent. Set and setting your mindset and your physical environment. Um, what happened in this? Someone's on a bicycle. Why? First known LSD experience, Albert Hoffman. Nice. 1943, Bicycle Day, April 19th. Um, this is not very helpful. <laughs> there is an increased risk of bringing out latently expressed or exacerbating current symptoms of psychotic disorders from psychedelics. This is circumstantial. So again, we can talk if you want more specifics on this. And what is it called when you do a very small amount of a drug on a regular basis? Microdosing. Microdosing. Okay. I'm very excited to be talking about Molly today. I'm just going to tell you. A quick harm reduction question. Yes. Uh, so you say if it's bitter, it's a spitter. Does simply spitting it out, is that going to keep them from tripping or is there something else that needs to be done in order to reduce the likelihood of the drug becoming activated in the system? That's a really good question. I would say the problem with putting a tab into your mouth is that your mucous membranes are immediately available. It's a very quick and fast way for any kind of um, material to absorb into your, your bloodstream. However, the faster you get it out of there, the better you're going to be, honestly. Um, you could try doing like a milk swish. I don't know if that would do anything. <laughs> I have no idea. To my knowledge, you just have to get it out as fast as possible and then monitor that person because oftentimes it's not 
like a huge deal, honestly. Like they might be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's not going to kill them if it's like a tiny quantity most of the time. But I can't say for certain, honestly. I, I would love to say for certain. So generally get it out fast and write it out then. Yeah, I would okay. say, but also monitor that person for any sign of right. like heightened blood pressure and seizing. However, also be mindful that the psychological implication that they could experience heightened blood pressure might make that person freak out a little bit. So if they don't know, then just like monitor them yourself. <laughs> and maybe after like a couple hours, you can be like, well, here's what I was looking for, but I didn't want to make the placebo come out. Okay. So generally speaking, Molly is a very popular party drug, right? Um, in often really problematic ways, and we'll delve into what those are today, but I would say that MDMA is possibly the most irresponsibly used party drug out there right now, which sucks, <laughs> honestly. Um, we'll talk about why it's used so specifically in party environments, but also on a medical or therapeutic scale, it's currently the single most effective PTSD treatment that we have ever discovered, period. Yeah, we'll get to that. So doing MDMA in a properly administered therapeutic setting can drastically reduce PTSD symptoms. We're talking like, I won't spoil the whole study, but somewhere between 60 and 70% of participants who'd had PTSD for an average of 19 years no longer qualified for PTSD after treatment, after three sessions. Um, in terms of depression and anxiety, shortly after doing MDMA, you are at risk of heightened depressive and anxious sim symptoms because of the, the effects of MDMA on your body. Um, if administered therapeutically slash correctly, basically, over periods of time, it is possible to see a decrease in those symptoms globally, but that really does depend on person to person and how they're using it. Rave blues. Yeah, that's known as Tuesday blues. We'll get there. So, um, as you might expect, the Anglo world is very fond of MDMA, particularly North America and Australia and certain regions of Europe and like kind of in Russia, but not nearly as much as Europe. Europe loves Molly. Like, damn, Europe goes hard on MDMA, especially Amsterdam. So, these substances we're about to talk about are both Schedule One drugs, which means that, again, they have a high potential for abuse, according to the U.S. government, and no currently accepted medical value. Many of the adulterants of MDMA and MDA are also Schedule One drugs, which is something that we'll come back to in terms of what's called analogs. So MDMA is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. And you might be looking at that and thinking, I don't know Molly was there. But this is an important time for me to point out the fact that many substances are very similar in chemical structure to other drugs, and yet have very unique and distinct effects. Please make sure that you're muted if you're not already. Thank you. An average dose of MDMA is between 80 and 150 milligrams. I would say that a starting dose of MDMA is between 100 and 120. Some people can go down as low as 80. Some people need 150, even 180 to roll, but that's really uncommon. Um, you should always ballpark it between 100 and 125 milligrams for a first go, I would say. You can do less of that as well. 100 milligrams, generally speaking, I have to see who's not muted so I can mute you, I'm sorry. Mm. Um, 125 milligrams, or I'm sorry, 100 milligrams is considered to be a point of MDMA. That's 0.1 grams is 100 milligrams. That is basically, if you're asking for five points of Molly from your dealer, they, they will give you 500 milligrams, usually packaged in individual capsules. And if they're crusty, it's probably going to be more like 60 to 70 milligrams. You should really get your own milligram scale and weigh it out because they lie. So just some terms to get out of the way for this. Gurning is known as involuntary jaw clenching and tooth grinding. And we know that the real term for gurning is trismus and bruxism, right? Um, rolling is when you're high on Molly, basically. This is some chick at a Katy Perry concert, <laughs> I guess. And then if someone is floored, it means that they are so high that they are just on the ground. Isn't that nice? Look at all these ravers, no phones in sight, living in the moment. <laughs> So rolling is a really common phenomenon that we see at festivals when you see people in a cuddle puddle just like on the ground splayed out on each other, oftentimes scratching each other's heads or like like this, sometimes you even get the like, you see the eyes wiggling like that, did I do it? 
So that's called nystagmus, and that's nothing to be concerned about with Molly. Oftentimes, if someone's rolling really hard, it can look really frightening to see their eyes wiggling like this. However, nystagmus is normal. It is a normal and reasonable response to MDMA. I would say generally, if your eyes are wiggling so hard and so often you can't read your phone screen, you should probably lower your dose. That is not necessarily like, you don't need to be rolling that hard probably. And we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but generally speaking, your MDMA results really do plateau after a certain dose. So you really do wanna find your sweet spot dose where you're not rolling so hard that you're so floored you can't get up to pee because that's just like fully not necessary and you might be far past what you need to hit that peak and you just like flatten out after that dose but you're still adding more to your body which can be harmful. Tuesday blues are known as the post-roll crash that some people experience and it's often latent actually it's often usually like a two to three day buffer when like you really just don't feel great that day. Some people don't get Tuesday blues at all usually people that are newer to rolling people that roll too frequently will often get Tuesday blues and we'll talk about what frequency should be um, followed here. Um, and Tuesday blues are, I think, usually referring to like Saturday night rolling. So it is about two to three days between them. Then there's trismus and bruxism. Remember that that's um, jaw clenching and spasms and tooth grinding. And often when you're rolling, you're not even aware of the fact that you're doing this. There is like actually a little bit of a mild anesthetic component to it, interestingly, that's been noted more and more through time. So often you won't know until the next day when you try and like eat some chips and you accidentally bite down on the inside of your cheek because it's so thick with scarring from the night before. And it does go away within like four or five days, I would say, but like you'll often stick your tongue out and see like a white line of scarring where you've been like biting into it. And that's why people had pacifiers at raves was to prevent trismus and bruxism. I want to get something out of the way with the names real quick because this is a huge problem on social media and in media in particular where people decide to kind of like um, Question is why would it take days to get out of your system? It doesn't it does not you come down within five hours It's just we'll, we'll talk to or I'll tell you why you might feel <laughs> My mom thought the fast fires were a fashion statement. I'm sure they became a fashion statement, you know But I'll tell you exactly why you might feel after effects a few days later. That's not just like oh, you're still high You do come down from all of these drugs like within a reasonable time frame um, They are cute so ecstasy is another word for pressies or pressed pills and these are like as you would probably imagine pressed in pill form now the reason that pressies are known as ecstasy is because oftentimes ecstasy contains stimulants. And the reason for this is that if you put less MDMA but more stimulants that feel a little bit like MDMA in it, then you can bulk your product with more easily attained drugs, basically. It's not a consistent and like eternal thing that you'll find stimulants in your ecstasy. However, it is very common to have press pills that are just caffeine and meth. And people that have never had experience with real MDMA before might do meth and be like, oh yeah, this feels like it. And let's work to destigmatize meth, okay? Like, it's not that crazy. <laughs> like, there are certainly a lot of risks and rewards to any particular drug. And yes, methamphetamine has a higher risk profile than other drugs. But I do want to be very mindful of making sure that everyone's aware that all drugs have risk and reward profiles, and meth and heroin are just consistently the most stigmatized among them. So we'll debunk that in a little bit. Um, Molly is the general slang term for the actual crystal or rock that comes in a capsule. And sometimes it can be crushed into powder, which is a little bit less safe, I would say. If you can get a crystal, get a crystal, because the chemist is the only one that can cut that. So either, either it's all MDMA or it's not, basically, or it might have a dusting of something on it, but getting crystals a lot safer than getting powder. Um, so that's just a term for it. If you're like, I wanna buy some Molly, what you're saying is, I would like MDMA in rock form, please. And if you say, I wanna buy some ecstasy, then you might be referring to press pills. These things get conflated all the time though. Like it, there's not one hard and fast rule for this, but keep it in mind. What I really want you to remember from this is that MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, that means that you are rolling. That's what you're looking for if you're trying to buy ecstasy or molly. What you actually get might be a different story, but if you're looking for that experience of rolling, MDMA is the chemical involved. Just to make it clear, this is molly. It can be in this form, or this form, or this form, but the chemical is MDMA. So 
possibly the, the I would definitely say that the two most common would be um, a pressed fill or a capsule with crystals or powder, but sometimes you can get fat rocks that are like six grams each and imported directly and scraped off the tray from the chemist. Those are the most reliable, but they're not always accessible. So usually you'll only find it in the form of a pressed fill or a um, capsule. But there are a lot of names for this, right? They're known as Rolls or Ecstasy or E or MD or Molly or Thiz or XTC if you want to be old school about it or Pressies, like lots and lots of names for MDMA. It goes by so many titles. Most of the time you're going to eat it and it doesn't last as long as people think it does. If you're rolling for eight hours, there's probably some methamphetamine in your MDMA. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. You shouldn't roll for more than like three hours before you start coming down. It's a short drug experience. So if your roll is drastically prolonged for one reason or another, it might have been adulterated. Be aware of that. If you snort it, you'll come up a lot faster. It will burn like an absolute motherfucker. MDMA is not a pleasant drug to snort and it's not great for your sinuses. So don't snort it unless you absolutely have to. And I can't really think of any times when you would need to do that. Like sometimes people will be like, oh, my friends dosed half an hour ago. I have to catch up. So they'll snort their molly instead. You can do it. <laughs> it's not gonna be good for your nose holes though. And then if you put it up your butt, it's actually like considered to be one of the more effective and safer ways of ingesting MDMA. Um, Ill-advised. Yeah, ow, it, ouch. Um, you can indeed put Molly up your butthole, and I would be lying to you if I said that it was a bad idea. If you're going to be consuming it in any way, just make sure that you're using sanitary materials. Lube that finger, baby. <laughs> Do not push that rock in dry. I apologize for all the people that had to hear me say that, but like sometimes it just be how it do, you know? So Molly is known as the love drug for a reason, right? Like this is an empathogenic substance. It makes you feel connected to the people that you're with. It makes you interested in who they are and what they have to say, their life experiences. And it also brings a new level of empathy for yourself and for others, which is part of why it's so powerful therapeutically in that context. Touch is very, very sensitized. So this is a very like physical, touchy, affectionate drug but it doesn't make you like lose control of yourself in the way that people sometimes think that, they, that it would. Let me make a clear distinction here because someone asked me this recently. It's not like Molly is like the truth serum where you just start spilling your guts about your feelings. It simply cracks the door ajar and you can look at it and decide if you want to take that path. MDMA makes you more willing to appreciate things in your life, but you can choose whether or not you want to do so. So it's basically like a softener, an opener, a lightener of existing emotions and states and feelings. It's really easy to get super invested in the life story of a person that you don't actually care about. And honestly, it's a really good technique to just get in the habit of, I think in general, is being interested in the people that you encounter, even if at first glance you don't think you should be. Sounds like it is good for an introvert, but not needed for an extrovert. Social lubricant, plur, plur, plur. <laughs> um, it is good for, like, that's part of why it's used in party settings is introverts often feel like they benefit greatly from it because it's true that, like, if you walk the walk, then eventually your brain does change to have that just become who you are. If you play a part for long enough, it changes the way that you interact with other people. It's true. So oftentimes people find that doing MDMA in party settings gets them more in the habit behaviorally. It breaks that barrier. It allows them to start interacting with people in a more open and authentic and interested way. And once you get in that habit of doing it, you can bring that again into your sober life. A lot of the lessons to be learned with drugs are that you can break down existing barriers for yourself while you're high because it makes it easier. And then when you're sober you can apply those lessons and become a better person it really depends on how you think about it though and what you're doing with intention so let me just tell you molly makes you feel really good like we're talking really good like you are a silky red velvet cupcake with cream cheese frosting kind of good and everyone else happens to be one too and you just want to rub your frosting all over them mm, i don't like that <laughs> 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 I take that back. I've never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I was I'm not that. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> anyway, Molly makes you feel really nice. And it also, like I said, can really enhance your connection with people. 
I personally think that using MDMA in a setting where you already know that you love and care about people and you want to strengthen your existing bond with them or overcome challenges with them is a really amazing use of this drug. However, you can also use it in settings where you want to just make a bunch of new connections or kind of overcome social anxiety or learn more about yourself. These are all valid reasons to use MDMA. In fact, whatever reason you want to use it for is valid for you. Just like be within your own well-being circle, whatever that means. However, it can also lead to a crash for some people, and this is especially important to note if you have a history of mental health concerns, especially pertaining to depression. Um, and if you do it in super high doses in really hot environments, it could potentially be dangerous physically. Does it feel like morphine? No, not even a little bit. It is a very different experience. The feeling of being on MDMA, the feeling like of rolling is like, everything is is well with the world but in a more euphoric way like not only does everything feel right with the world but you are just like so excited about the prospect of pursuing these relationships you are so happy to be where you are nothing can go wrong right now and you're ready to explore and with morphine it's and other opioids um, can also cause a person to feel more emotionally needy and excessively clingy. It can, depending on who the person is. I would say that that's a less common effect of MDMA. Um, it, it really depends on whether you're with people that are on the same level as you, honestly, when you're rolling. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you that sometimes being sober around people that are rolling is really goddamn obnoxious <laughs> because they're all like, oh my god, have I ever, have I ever told you that you mean so much to me? And you're like, shut up. But if you're with other people that are rolling and you're in this together, it's a really wonderful kind of validation experience. Um, but it does not feel like morphine. It does have that kind of like bliss sensation. Um, your body temperature really rises on MDMA, and this is the single most dangerous part of rolling, is heightened body temperature. I can't stress this enough. If someone overheats, there are neurological complications that can arise, and also having too high of a body temperature in general is not good for your body or your brain. So if someone appears to be sweating excessively while they're rolling and their hair is matted to their face and like you can see their eyes wiggling, get them out of the venue that they're in get them to fresh air, cool them off. It will reduce the intensity of their roll a little bit, but it can save their life. Don't let people overheat on MDMA. It's an easily avoidable problem. And it's part of the reason that at festivals, medical often has a cool down box basically, where they stick people with like a bunch of high powered fans to reduce their body temperature. Um, your pupils get really blown out, time dilates on MDMA as well. Now, previously we'd made MDMA through the process of, let me see what, which one is it? Um, I will be going, Duchess, I will be going over the recommended frequency of rolling, possibly, probably not today. Yeah, we only have 10 minutes. Um, and we'll also talk about interactions, Orion. We'll talk about all of those things, don't worry. Comprehensive. Um, I hope that you're enjoying this GIF <laughs> that I love so much. So previously we'd made MDMA from saffron, which was a derivative of the, of the sassafras plant, but since it's an endangered plant that's been going through a lot of poaching, we found an alternative called PMK glycidate. And so now it's not really quite as dependent on like poaching from a sensitive biome, which is awesome. And then you stick some methylamine in it, bada bing, bada boom, you got this chick, rolling balls uh, with someone giving her a light show with a bunch of singles. Now the history of MDMA, I just get so giddy about this because the scandal here is unbelievable. Like, wow, like conspiracy theory level scandal, but it's all provable and real. So we get this guy, Alexander Shulgin, Sasha Shulgin, the godfather of psychedelics. We here at Harm Reduction pray to Sasha Shulgin before bed every night and leave out a plate of cookies for him because this guy really pioneered not only the production of several hundred psychedelics, I believe, but also wrote an entire series of books that documents in him and his wife Anne doing all of them and reporting their experiences with all of them. So we have this Bible of, of drug experiences made by the guy that made those drugs in a lot of cases. All hail Shogun. So 1975, um, this had been synthesized in the past, but he was like, oh, this is great. I use it as my evening martini. And then he decided, I'm gonna tell people about this. I'm gonna tell my friends and some researchers and also the party kids, because why not? They need to be included in this as well. So Shulgin started telling people about MDMA and previously there had been like hundreds of psychiatrists and doctors. To be clear, that's MDMA in the bag and that's a psychiatrist. I don't know how clear this, this gif is, but I enjoy it. 
hope you do as well. So there had been hundreds of psychiatrists and doctors that had been utilizing MDMA in their therapy sessions for like a decade, I think approximately after it was discovered, but they knew they were watching the Nixon administration come in balls to the wall and start outlawing a bunch of shit. And they were like, we have to keep this on the DL until we have really good data to back it up so that we can present this and be like, we need this drug to be available to people basically. So this was the late seventies and early eighties. And then Shulgin kind of went and fucked it up and told everyone about it, but we love him anyway. Now, there, in the late 70s, there were these two groups that were making MDMA, the Boston group, and um, I think that they were functioning out of New York City as well. So in New York City, club kids discovered MDMA. It like leaked out of these pharmaceutical research agencies into these club kids scenes, and the, the guys that were running these groups kind of were like, well, we see what's about to happen right now. Like We see the amount of potential here, but we're also really nervous about what's going to go down with the government. So in the early 80s, a group of them split off to form the Texas group in Texas, as you might imagine. And they just made a ton of molly. They decided, we're going to make as much of this as we can to distribute it before it gets criminalized. So they made like 2 million pills of MDMA. And then I made this awful meme that, once again, I think is funnier than everyone else does. And then, of course, the government starts catching on. And this guy, John C. Lawn, who is one of the big no-no names in drug history, 1985 was the GA admin and he was like we need to get rid of this like we need to ban MDMA and it was really starting to become more popular in club scenes and like hundreds of researchers came together and wrote a document to the government saying hey like we've actually been using this in our research for a really long time and it's really effective and really important um and John was like John <laughs> Mr. Lawn was like well, I mean, you haven't actually like fully officially published these reports, so you, what you say has no value to me. So we're just gonna like get rid of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So because of this, the DEA was like, okay, we're gonna make MDMA Schedule One, and actually, this went all the way up, I think, to the Supreme Court. Maybe I don't remember how far it went, and they were like, "Yo, this is ridiculous! Like, you can't do this. Your administrative oversight is like getting botched right now because this drug does not have the kind of evidence behind it that you're saying it does. It, in fact, it has the opposite. We have a stack of of testaments from all these people being like, oh, MDMA is actually kind of tight.' So." Through this, this procedural ruling, it actually got pushed back to Schedule 4, I think, or Schedule 3 for a couple of months. And then John just, like, went in there again and was like, fuck the ravers, I hate MDMA, we're going to make a Schedule 1 again. And it just stayed there. But this was, like, a huge thing back and forth. Now, I have a couple minutes left. If we're looking at MDA in recreational settings, we got... Um, 1996 in LA, this was like when MDMA started really rising in popularity in the underground scene. Um, this is a subway party in 1996 in LA playing Gabber. You can see the bucket hats and like the joggers and yeah, go dumb. So this is like the birth of MDMA in recreational environments, right? But let's look at it in therapy real quick. As a fully qualified transpersonal psychologist, George Sands, an alias, has conducted ecstasy therapy sessions for over 25 years. It allows someone to be open to their own emotions. There is a loosening around the judgment that they have about themselves, about what has happened. There's a loosening around sh the shame. And so there's a room then to engage those memories or the experiences in a very different way. I am so at peace inside right now that I feel like I'm sleeping. Oh, and I do, I feel like a huge weight has been lifted. Mm -hmm. The MDMA induces an inner calm that helps patients confront memories and emotions that are too painful to deal with otherwise. It has to be pure to be able to get this kind of response. This is inner peace at its best and outer peace because I feel great. During the 1960s and 70s, ecstasy was legally used in alternative therapy sessions where it earned the nickname penicillin for the soul. But as the rave scene's use of ecstasy flourished, 
it led to a spate of casualties. Fear of the drug's potential health risks prompted a ban in 1985, despite protests from therapists across the globe. After four hours, the MDMA part of the session is over. I just got the jitters and happiness going on. I feel like the weight of the world is off my shoulders for the first time in ever. Yeah. The therapy helps Sue to see a way of moving out from under the shadow cast by the loss of her relative. I couldn't help her, but I can help her kids. And she would thank me for that. Can't bring her back, but I can bring them forward. I'm feeling that thing and I'm going to start crying about this. All right, we have time for just one more thing. Now let's talk about the actual, oh. We're facing a real data dilemma. We added MDMA. What MDMA? I love this. Okay, this guy is talking about the recent developments in um, when it's combined with psychotherapy has actually been shown in some early clinical trials to be very effective for reducing PTSD symptoms and keeping them away. In this treatment, MDMA is not used as a treatment in and of itself. It's used to enhance the effectiveness of psychotherapy for PTSD. MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is a treatment that happens in a clinic under therapeutic review with trained and licensed therapists and is very much not a take two and call me in the morning kind of situation. So for example, nobody would ever uh, get a prescription for MDMA to then go fill at a local pharmacy. MDMA assisted psychotherapy is given in three psychotherapy sessions with MDMA over a 10 week course of psychotherapy. So people only take the drug three times. In these early clinical trials, 100 participants were treated with either MDMA assisted psychotherapy or placebo plus psychotherapy. In those trials with placebo, 23% no longer qualified for PTSD after three treatments. Now, those are actually pretty good results by clinical trial standards, uh, but when we added MDMA, that 23% went up to 61%. 61% after just three sessions no longer had PTSD. Now, they didn't just see their symptoms reduced. These people didn't qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. Now, with no further treatments, one year later, that number went up to 68%. They didn't take the drug again, but kept getting better. Something inside these people had changed. They tried other treatments. They tried medications. They tried psychotherapy for PTSD, and they hadn't worked for any of these people. And significantly, they had suffered from PTSD for an average of 19 years. MDMA does have side effects, and it's 19 years. Okay, y'all. I'm going to stop there for today, and next week we will finish up talking about MDMA, and then I think move on to either stimulants or dissociatives as our next spotlight. If you have questions from today or if you want something clarified, feel free to email me, and I will email out a generalized response. I have a little more time now that I was over. Ray, you can stop recording.